I'm Charlie White. Um, and uh, Mark Horowitz. And we're going to have a conversation that is uh, bigger or broader than this exhibition. Uh, we're a little bigger and broader as, as two people. Um, I first met or got to know Mark uh, prior to him entering the graduate program uh, at USC, where he got his MFA, at, when I was the director of that program. And bringing Mark into the program was uh, the beginning of a, a dialogue because of where Mark was in his life at that time, uh, the kind of work he had done, and the type of transition uh, his intention to go to graduate school uh, meant for him, right, and what he wanted to do. And we had some, I think really prior to actually ever physically meeting, some pretty, uh, some somewhat passionate discussion about what that meant because even at the threshold of entering graduate school, you were questioning graduate school, uh, questioning if you should go, questioning what it would do for you and, and how it would work. Because as I presume most of you know, Mark had already done a, a significant number of things um, in the kind of popular realm of the internet um, and that were action or life or uh, socially based, but they weren't studio based. So having a studio was not a natural part of your process. So what I thought would be a valuable thing is for us to kind of, within an hour, kind of chronologically go over some things, uh, starting with who that Mark Horowitz was, because that Mark Horowitz had a public persona and was a functioning person. So if you were gonna summarize who you were, um, you know, in 2009 or by 2009, oh, what was that? Oh my God. Well, it's a different thing from where this is. So yeah. we're going to have to walk, we're going to walk through like everybody doesn't know anybody. Right. Okay. Who I was. Um, you know, I had, I had originally started as a painter and then uh, went to the Art Institute and met with, or studied under Harold Fletcher. Who do I talk to? Do I talk half to you? And, I you talk to the polls. Okay, I'll there. just, yeah. So I, uh, I study with Harold, I'm sorry, I've just never done this. I study with Harold Fletcher and John Rubin. They were uh, heavy into social practice, and that was a new art form for me at the time. Uh, I went to the San Francisco Art Institute to study painting, in fact, with Joe Rison, who's here. Um, and uh, I, I sort of shifted, I got really comfortable with photography and, and sort of documenting these weird moments that I was creating, and that sort of led to documenting myself uh, doing performances. And so I started leaning more and more toward doing performance and public intervention. Um, up to the time that I met Charlie, I had done stuff where I had a fake uh, company in San Francisco called Slivendola Enterprises. I had uh, a pack mule that I did my errands on for a year, um, and various other things. Coffee in the park, I served free coffee to people uh, using 1,500 feet of extension cord that I took from my kitchen to the park. Um, I mean, it was very weird. It was like, but and then- And dinner with Mark. And then, yeah, exactly. I mean, and so this stuff sort of started getting some media traction, and I was like, well, instead of me having to document this myself or having a friend document it, why not have the media start to document my projects and process for me? Uh, and then that's when it led to Dinner with Mark where I was a photo assistant for my, my day job or job. And um, I wrote Dinner with Mark and then put my cell phone number on a dry erase board uh, that was featured in a product shot for Crate and Barrel. And then I didn't think too much about it, but I said to everybody on set, I was like, Look, I'll take whoever calls out to dinner and I'll meet them in their hometown. This will be a, a really, whatever, this will be interesting. Because at the time, I'll, I'll make this a little quicker, but at the time, I had $50 as, as a per diem given to me by Crate and Barrel. And if I didn't spend it, I didn't get to keep it. And I didn't like that. And so I put it on Craigslist that I would take whoever, whoever reached out to me via email, I'll take them out to dinner. And so then I started curating these dinners with these people that were calling me, and I was on the morning news in Chicago the day of when I wrote Dinner with Mark and then put my cell phone number on it, because I thought it would be an interesting way to sort of broadcast this further. So it was kind of like an inside joke and kind of not. Uh, it was printed, 
Uh, and then the catalog was sent to lots of people. And then eventually I was on the Today Show and in People Magazine as like one of the most eligible bachelors. Got a phone call from the CEO of Crate and Barrel, said he would sue the shit out of me if I went on the Today Show. And I was like, I have nothing, good luck. And so I went on the Today Show. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, anyhow, so. So that's a very different you. That's a very different me. And then that, that dinner tour led to me getting an agent in, in LA at William Morris. And I thought then, why not go further into this beast and, and then sort of co-opt the, the apparatus that is, enter, that, that is LA Hollywood Entertainment and have them sort of help me engineer and, and make these pro projects. So the ideas got bigger and bigger uh, and scarier and scarier. And then I started losing a lot of control. Uh, when I talked to Charlie first, I had, I had banked on the fact of getting into school. I didn't know if I was going to, but I fired my agent before I talked to him. And I was like... It's uh, like a prerequisite of our program was don't get involved and don't have an agent and exactly, don't show. Exactly, exactly. That, and that's good. And I broke all those rules. No, I broke some of them. I learned yesterday that he was going to kick me out of school, actually. And I didn't know this. Mm -hmm. But when it, Mark, when Mark, <laughs> um, when Mark entered, well, anybody in the program, quite frankly, um, one of the, the, and I can say this because it's a requiem for the program, as most of you know, so it's not really there anymore. But when it was in full form, the idea, because it was a fully funded program, was that we would have a level of and a degree of commitment to the program uh, because it's brief. MFA programs are brief. Um, they're not PhD programs. They don't have the time for a dissertation. They don't have much. So if you think about any of our lives, and most of us luckily are over 30 or over 35, you know, two years is a very short period of time. So the desire was, and part of the gamble with Mark and, and some, some other students, but really Mark was an example, was can you do this in the most conservative fashion in relationship to the cohort that you'll study with, 16 people, and the faculty, five faculty, and not show, not exhibit, and not enter the, the, the fray while you're here in order to get from one point to another. And we believed in what we did in that way, that things would transform if we could work in an insular environment and take a practice and take it through a number of steps um, that ultimately, I think, occurred in, in an enormous way between you and also other people you worked with. But in the midpoint, Mark had an opportunity to go to the Miami uh, Art Fair and do something in relationship to one of his social media-based projects, and it jeopardized him attending his final crit. And I was in New York, and we had a phone conversation uh -huh. when he was there. And it's a funny moment to go back to, but I was, I think, screaming. Oh, yeah. Would be. I was terrified. I was terrified. The, the summary of it, because it was breaking what we thought was the fundamental rule. You're going to do that thing in that space, which is not entirely different than this space, uh, for, you know, for the rest of your life. The whole idea is that you don't do it now in order to actually see what might happen in the absence of other people being part of that dialogue in your head or other people's interests or intentions or desires or goals of monetizing on you or any of those things. So, um, but we got past it. And, uh, yes, we did. <laughs> and I think it actually had, a, I, think, I think in the end, it had a very uh, good outcome because I think that that one first project that you did in school was the, the last project of its, of its kind. Of its kind. Yeah, of that, of that sort of social practice era even. I mean, it did, it represent a total breakdown and like, I think that by Charlie yelling at me and me getting a ticket 30 minutes after the phone call um, <laughs> and going and... It's like a verbal yeah. STD. It's oh like you do God. something that I you know, know is risky <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to get through this. And then the minute you're at the doctor, you're like, I should not have done that. Right. And I knew I shouldn't have done that. I was like... I was like an institutional STD. Yes. I was like, you're getting infected. Yeah. While I was yelling on the phone. Yep. 
And you know, at that moment too. I mean, at that time, like uh, I had a one of the crits, Bruce Hanley, compared me to Hitler. It was just like it was very difficult for me. It was it was it was a project through creative time, and it was I was confused. It was the worst thing I'd ever done in my life. I've since hidden it. You can't even find it. Sites down. No way. Failure is good. Yeah. Failure is good, and failure my work is, is very much so about failure. But that represented a deep chasm of failure. Let's, okay, so let's yeah. let's talk about. Because I don't think that it's easily or readily available that failure is evident in aesthetic experience. Well, it can be, but it would index it. But your work, prior works, always risked failure. Right? Part of the tension was the possibility that you're doing something that you could get um, arrested, or you're doing something and you could find yourself in a circumstance that's dangerous to you or dangerous to others. But then all of that energy and all of that risk went somewhere else. Where, where did it go? Oh boy. Um, I think, you know, part of that failure, I mean, I described coming, coming to this work and coming at this work is that moment, like when you're walking and you trip on a crack in the sidewalk. And that moment, that very split second when you don't know if you're going to fall or you don't know if you're going to catch yourself. Mm -hmm. And what's going to, you don't even, you don't even think about anything else. It's such a weird space. Mm -hmm. Um, but then something happens and either you fall and you get up and you laugh it off like, you know, mm -hmm. I meant to do that or you catch yourself and you still laugh it off like I meant to do that uh, or you just eat shit and that's that and you go to the hospital, whatever happens afterward. But it's that space in between, I think, is which a lot of the projects before we're operating and a lot of this work is, is coming out of, you know, that energy. How did you stop having an audience? What did it mean to not have an electronic, it's an antiquated word, but it's tr I guess it's the truest word, an electronic, like a proxy audience. Everything you had done had that utterly, I would say, meaningless proxy clapping and cheering along, like this invisible... Or trolling. Whatever it or, is, yeah. it's this invisible agent of this thing, I had, this thing I posted has value because this many people said I like it, or this thing has value because this many people are watching, and all of a sudden, because I, I'm asking that question because it ultimately was the seed to generate this because this, all of this, and for anybody who is invested in doing this with their time, knows that it's a, a solitary experience. It's utterly lonely. Your idea may be over or seem to be over or behind you by the time you get it out into the world. There's no immediacy to it whatsoever. That's yet. not true necessarily. How is it not true? I think there's plenty of immediacy and that's why I wanted to come to this work. Because I was tired of all the little birds chirping and, and the audience and the directions and the endless possibilities. I feel like this to me represents total immediacy where you can see you have a yellow color and you put it on a canvas and there it is staring you at the face in, in the face and it's it's that quick it's that moment and then it's that sort of like but it doesn't have an immediacy dialogue. in relationship to anyone beyond you and the canvas it doesn't have an immediacy in terms of you posted it or you put it out there and people saw it and responded i guess that that's what i okay. mean by immediacy All that right. you could have a pleasurable experience making a mark or seeing a thing but ultimately in relationship to whatever person or persons see it in the future, that's not happening for an extended period of time. No one saw this for an extended period of time. This took an extended period of solitary time to create. That's a, I think to me, I mean in my, my view, is that's a leap, and I'm going back to earlier work, including time-based work, that is about forming something that yes, will participate in a broader dialogue, but is not in dialogue right away, or part of a dialogue. So I just, I guess I go back to the same question, what did it mean if everything you were doing had some quantifiable measure of attention in the, in, in the process of doing it? That, that being all of the, or any of the online projects, and then your persona being seemingly known as an online persona, what did it mean to become or return to? I guess you could look at it that way from you having studied painting, but return to being solitary. I think, I mean, first, embarrassment. I mean, it was just absolute embarrassment. 
So I felt like after that Creative Time project, The Advice of Strangers, I was like publicly humiliated and personally humiliated. And I, I, all I wanted to do was just hide. I never wanted to be in front of a camera ever right. again. Um, was it like slut shaming? Kind of. No. <laughs> Truly. It is a little bit I mean, like no, that. No, no, it I really mean, it's is. It's not that yeah. different than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, all I wanted to do was hide, and like, and you know, the la the next project after that was these two dust clods that were yeah. talking. It was Chris Coy yeah. and I. Yeah. And it was a it was a full costume, and it was like you couldn't see anybody's face. You could just hear voices. Right. And you were watching these dust clods sort of move around and, and interact and talk, and it was a 15 minute, you know, one take, improv piece. And then the next one was. A half a paint based on that little based on these abject objects talking and then I was getting the dialogue out through these like abject objects right. you were telling me to look at Mike Kelly's stuffed animal piece mm -hmm. you know, at that time mm -hmm. uh, and you know and then I even morphed the voices and did subtitles after mm -hmm. that and then you know I just sort of wanted to further abstract so you know, let's, the language. let's go from the fact that your work most of it from the beginning had levity Right? right, and that levity had a certain like there was a certain part of it that had comedy in it. You're funny, like you're funny. You Thank have you. a nice, Thank funny you. way about you, um, <laughs> in a nice way. I mean that to be nice. It's like you're funny, and and comedy became a bigger part of your practice in and of itself, in a way, when that stuff started. Things were not funnier, but they were predicated on something that was both serious and funny. So what, where, and this has, and is carried through, some level of comedy, without a doubt, right? Some of it is more obviously comedic, but there's humor in everything you do. There's a humor. So talk maybe a little bit about comedy and humor and, and wh how, what those things are to you and why they have value. Oh, wow. So I think comedy for me, it's just, it's kind of an escape. It's an escape hatch, you know, very much so like putting my number in Crate and Barrel uh, was like a portal. It's like, a, it's like you're in this like very vanilla world and then all of a sudden there's this exit. And so I feel like a lot of that work and when I did the anonymous semi-nudist colony and set up... Uh, that was very funny. That was very funny. Yeah. You know? It was funny. You looked funny. I looked like, yes. If you have ever seen it, it's <laughs> funny. It's very funny. Like, I don't, I think I say it in a way with my voice and it's a, it doesn't sound funny. <laughs> I can't pitch shit. <laughs> it was funny. Funny. Yeah. 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 And, but it was funny. I mean, there was a kind of like taking off your shirt and your body and, and the mask. It's like all of these things were fine, but that hasn't gone away. Like no. that's a through line. But it's that's in this room. Uh, so w go back and... You want to go way back? I no, no, way I wanna, back. no, I, I mean, want to go okay, wait. Right. I want to go all right. in. Okay, all right. Where all right, is okay. the comedy? Like what, what is the, why the comedy? Um, <laughs> it's, it's a hard question, man. I mean, I think it's just, I really feel that it's integral to me making the work. I, 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 I also, for a long, that's why I got so close to the sun of entertainment, uh, because, you know, and I came to Hollywood and got that agent, and they were like, oh, you're a comedian. And I was like, I'd never been called a comedian. Right. I had no idea what that meant. Right. Uh, I just thought, just by being funny, I not only entertained myself, you know, and, right. and, and made like an alternative, like sort of uh, landscape for myself in every situation, right. you know, I mean, it's a coping mechanism, probably. Okay, good. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> right, okay. So, thanks. I just got, it's like, it's like You're fishing. Like, I could just see you just waiting for the little thing in. to go down under oh the water and know I have a fish. Jesus Christ. What are you coping with? Deep pain. I told you all this is going to be very fucking real. <laughs> but it's real. And it it's real. real enough in that I, I, I obviously, I'm, I have the answer a little bit in knowing you, so... Why are people funny could be a broad statement, but let's just use you as an example. Sure. Why are you funny? Why is that? Because part of what you do is you do, sometimes it's very strategic and it's really elegant um, and it's not this. And I don't want to summarize everything as like you have to deflate something because you can't cope with it and when you deflate it, it becomes malleable and you can make fun of it and make light of it and other people can be relieved with you. I mean, there's that model. And there are other times where it's just very strategic. I could put this together with this and it would be funny for a reason or it would have value 
that would be predicated on it being humorous, but it would actually show something else. So there are two different things, and you do both. But let's talk about the deflation of things, because even our initial conversation about graduate school or what having a serious moment in an environment that is easy to deflate. It's easy to deflate that environment. And, you know, for you know, anyone who's been in an environment that is, you know, within the academics of, of art, there is a moment in which if you pull back, you can laugh at just about any crit. You can laugh at yourself. You can laugh at the language we use. You can laugh at the seriousness. You can laugh at how people sit. Really this kind of crit Finger, sitting for men, it's, it's, you and, can, and you, you come can, up and you're like, is it about that? Yeah, like, yeah, the, yeah hook, it is. Yeah, it's, hook, it's, yeah, a, it's, 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 there's a comedy to it, but, but it's not actually a comedy act at all. It's Definitely the only not. way where it takes place. Somehow it, it takes on the form of something that you can laugh, laugh at, but you laughed at school a little bit as you entered it and you wanted to deflate it a little bit. So it was an enterable space yeah. that wouldn't hurt you, which oh, I, I, I get. Any, anybody should get because no one, you know, it's one thing to be hurt when you're armed. It's another thing to be hurt when you're naked. And the requirement was that, like you have to be as, as, be as exposed as possible in yourself and in your interests and what you want to do and take risks. That, that asks a lot of someone. And you've gone through that, but what is the coping from? Is it fear or is it anxiety about something not working what is it yeah I mean I think it's like I never felt comfortable in any well I mean gosh I mean you could go way back and let's say, go way back fine <laughs> all right so I, I <laughs> so I grew up in, in, in like a really horrible environment growing up and I moved maybe 50 times before I was 15 right I left home at 15 I lived in a basement in the middle of a town of 300 people and then after I graduated from high school, I was uh, cross-pollinating corn at $4.32 an hour. And my friend was like, you're smart, come to Indiana University, study business, and get the fuck out of this situation. Right. You know, and so uh, at that point, I, had, I probably had 30 or 40 jobs even. Like, right. making it for myself at 15 was crazy. And so it was about like going into a new situation, and I think the quickest way in to, some, to, to a group or to somebody is humor. Right. And so I think to enter any social situation or any new situation, if you can immediately diffuse it and make fun of it, you know, right. at the, at, at, by making fun of it, you diffuse it, then it opens up to you. And then right. you can control it however you want. You can control people. It's like, right. it's very, it creates a malleable that, environment. That's a big answer. Yeah. And I think that, another, so a part of that is, and I think that this really matters, um, did you go in debt from undergrad? Yes. You did, yeah, right. I, yeah. And this is, uh, I mean, it's a, I'm bringing up a subject of my own personal concern as I think about what it means to go to school. Our program funded you, and that was part of it, that you wouldn't go further in debt. And it, the economics of life are scary to you. And I, think that, and I think that that is something that is rarely, if ever, discussed. So when you felt that something, anything, whatever it was, could possibly offer possible even relief relief or stability or something you were attracted to that i yeah. no, no, go ahead. no go i was ahead. just saying i felt that that was our conversation in a manner right. of speaking that day that i was yelling at mark about being in miami was in fact about the the reality of what i very empathetically understood which was if something could possibly help me how can I say no to it? And how do you explain to somebody that the only thing that can fundamentally help you get through this is not being part of anything that is being told to you that you should do and only doing the thing that you know ultimately if you end up being able to do it, you will have control over it. I mean, the difference between, let's say, that moment and this moment is control. Right? That yeah. this is the result of your own decision making process. It's not without support. It's not without a number of things that buttress any individual up to be able to be in a studio or to make work, but it isn't at the expense of you. Right. And that moment potentially was at the expense of you, not by my own subjective 
decision making that this is good and this is bad, but by what we had already talked about a year earlier, which was I want to get from A to B, I want to understand things in a different way so that I'm not only instrumentalizing my kind of natural talent as a character, as a persona. I want to be someone who's making things and I want it, those things to be made to be mine. And how far are you at this point now, because it's six years or five years, from that moment? Can, can you map that out enough in your head or is it too short of a period of time to see where you went from the thing that makes public persona as their center to the thing that makes kind of actual material objects, which could look, be looked at as antiquated, but I think we would argue are the opposite of antiquated that this is more present day than being online? Uh, that transition was big. I mean, I graduated 2012, so it's been whatever. Yeah, I don't know, four years, five years. Uh, Three, th four years. Something. But a after, after school was awful, uh, and I started, I had no idea. I remember having Glenn Phillips come to my house, mm. and we had a studio visit, and I got so drunk during the studio visit because I was so nervous uh, and it was just a mess. I, I can't even remember. I remember like showing him out the backyard and just told him to leave I think at some point or something. I don't know what the fuck happened even. I was like this is a fucking low point. But then it got lower and, and so <laughs> but I mean it was crazy. I met Petra and then we like had a time uh, I, 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 don't, I mean, a lot of it was like drugs and alcohol, and so like within that time though, I, I got sober and I said like, there's, there was a lot of time spent doing that and trying to hide from myself, and the only time I would paint or draw or something was when I was completely drunk, because right. that's when I gave myself the, the, the permission to like enter into that, that zone that I wanted to be in, but didn't allow myself to be in it. Okay, so what is that zone? It's like, it's complete silence. Is this that zone? Yes. So what is I mean, is it's this? getting there. Okay, this so is if, getting to that right, zone. Okay. So if this is right. like just entering that threshold, what, alley. What, is, <laughs> what is that? What, because we can see it and we can talk about it aesthetically or we can talk about its historical indexes which are throughout the, the works, but I'm much more interested in being in a therapist's office for a minute more than in a gallery. So let's, let's stay in a therapist's office for a minute because it's, it's more exciting for them and it's, it's, it's more enriching for you. Uh, and it's what I do. <laughs> I'm just looking so, at you like, have mercy on me. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what is that? No. So, but we're getting, remember, we're getting, no, like, no, we're, no. Get, we're, we're sober now, it's we're right. through time, we're okay, in a we're better place. Yeah, right. I'll take you right. back, but we'll go there. Sure. What, what is that place? Like, what, what, when you allow yourself to do this, what is this? I mean, it is a very real place. It's like a place of, of, of absolute loss of persona, loss of ego, loss of audience. Uh, and it's like, it's just a, it's like a free pass. It's like a, you know, it's like a, a, a time to like sort of exp explore a lot of the ideas and, and, and things I would write all in these black books all the time and do these videos and you know it's just taking all that mania all that energy right. and like that tornado uh, uh, of thought and energy and and control and uncontrol and loss and, and okay, recuperation. You, you mentioned mania and I have that yeah that something for me so in that mania can you tell me what matters in the, in the eye of the mania? Sure, whatever. In the mania as a, as a constellation of things. But things matter. Like we all have things at any given time that if we force ourselves or are forced in life to decide what matters, you know, if you're a parent and you're about to go around a car really fast, the only thing that might keep you from pushing on the accelerator, even though you hate the person driving slow, is your kid. If you don't have a kid, you went around that car. That's my theory. You're going around that car. If you do, you don't. So what are the, so you immediately start to organize things in your mind in life about what matters. If you're clean, you know what matters. If you're sober, you know what matters. Pretty much because you at some point were on pavement and you learned that's as low as you go and everything from that point up matters. Never going back to that pavement is the goal, right? Never going to the bottom is the goal because you were there. Mm -hmm. So what, what matters? And it's not about 
sobriety. It's not about any of those things. I mean, conceptually, what matters? <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> know, I'm just like, geez, man, that's, that's heavy. It's, a, it's like carrying a rock. When you're making this. Um, I mean, I think it matters. It's, it's, a, it's about getting to an honest place. That's it. I think it matters getting to... But honest about what? Honest about... Uh, it's honest about that... It's honest about that moment at which... I, don't, I mean, it's, it's like at which the, the synapse hits and it comes out and it's an honest gesture. It's an honest... It's an honest gesture. Okay. So then... It's not about trying to do this to get a laugh. Right. It, there's no audience. Right. So that's, I think it's about coming down to like honest mark making, you know, like honest. And that happens, but there's also a considerable amount of either spatial representation or. Well, for this show, there's a lot of. Subject based representation. So what, what are you, in, in entering a canvas, going everything from, you know, cave paintings, to Rococo bodies, to Twomley-esque marks, to Greek figurative sculptures that may or may not in fact have even been Greek, you know, so all, like, how does that, how do you negotiate those things? Why choose these things, or why did they, why did these come in? I mean, a lot of the well, I felt like in going back into painting that I had to sort of prove that I was a painter to the, so in that sense I was performing. Okay. And that's where I think I was being dishonest with myself. In this sense, I was like trying to prove that I could paint. So I thought, well, what did I do when I entered, like it was almost like an arrested stage because I was painting in 2000 and then I kind of, I quit. Right. And so I didn't have any dialogue around painting. I didn't have anything but that moment. And before that, I was a child. And so really it's, those, it's like that pond hop, you know. And then I'm here and I didn't like go around and, and poll like what, what do I paint. Right. So I went inside and I said, well, I should, I feel like I need to hang these honest marks, this mark making on work that, uh, that I believe is has levity, you know, ha has, has, uh, has an energy that is akin to mine. And so I turned to Guarancino, who is a 17th century draftsman, where most of this stuff comes from. There's Corot and there's a couple other references in there, but mostly it's this guy, Guarancino, the squinter. And I felt like I was in dialogue with this part of history. And it was a. It was just a. It was a place to start. It was like it was a very natural and comfortable place for me to start laying down the foundation of what I think is a beginning of uh, a much longer dialogue with painting. And when just to jump around a lot, okay, a little. When you go here, where does all of the proxy dynamic go? Does it? Is it gone? Do you? feel like at your, the point, and it, it's partially age, age in a very specific way, not numeric, but you, you had a very symbiotic relationship with the internet. And now that ends. And I think that that, not to move away from the work again, but I think that if things are talked about, they should be things of, of specific value. And I think we have an opportunity to talk about something that I, that I feel is important because very few of us in general in society, w m many people are going through the first pendulous relationship to an online existence. And what happens when that pendulum of immersion into that space for any of us, and it could be labor and electronic aspects of our job with email destroying our lives in a workplace, we, move, we start to move away. You moved away. Yeah. Like the pendulum swung far away. Um, not do you miss it, but what is life without it? And, and how much of it as remnant is playing out in everything you do anyhow? Or is it playing out or not? Mm. Well, I mean, like I, I, I think like going back to that sort of performer and performing as painter, I think like that for me was like performing without 
Well, it, it was, this is where I was dishonest with myself. It was like performing a painter, performing the character of what I thought a painter should be. And so that, that was weird. Did it was, you do it was it like performing for your, it was like performing or was it for just a mirror. private? It was totally private, totally in my head. Right, okay. It was like this. Well, we all do that. Oh, I mean, we all do that anyways, I think. Um, but I think going away from making work online, uh, it was just, but it wasn't like it happened overnight. I mean, it was like a very slow transition out of it. You know, but when you were in the studio making all of this, right. you were not. I wasn't posting a lot doing of images. That. No, you were not in there. Like some people in the last five years, you know, they've been these kind of frames with online culture, and the most recent frame is, you know, a kind of preformed platform exploitation. So what Instagram is for artists is based in a very, as you know, from my relationship to the internet or your relationship, and we're not that, that different in our stages, uh, it's a pre-existing platform that you just utilize. You don't build it, you don't make it, you don't brand it, you don't create it, it has no plasticity, it's nothing. It's nothing, it's a public bulletin board. And it's not even a public bulletin board, because real public bulletin boards were amazing spaces they were. Uh, that were highly dynamic and created uh, a space where you, if you didn't invent your own vernacular for how to operate in them, you didn't exist. And you didn't keep up with that vernacular, you couldn't, it wasn't legible to you. So you got to be on B every day. If you're not there every day in B, you're going to lose track of things. And that, that was an, a, a kind of addiction. Well, that's gone. So you've stepped away from it when a lot of people were stepping into it, but you never made anything that existed in preformed platform terms. You generated entire things, entire pieces of kind of conceptual architecture, even if they were proto or you know, mimetic of a branded identity. It was not a branded identity that was floating within social media. It was something that had its own site and its own form and its own message, everything. It was its own container, it was its own thing, it had to circulate itself. So you stepped out of it at a very specific time. Do you think that makes sense? Do you think that the, that, do you think that the entire platform, all of it writ large, had become unappealing too? Yes, I would say like a lot of this has to do with me not agreeing with what, you know, where a lot of my peers and a lot of artists are going. I mean, with, gosh, I don't mean to throw everybody under the bus, but it's just Don't like, throw them under the bus, but explain to me why they sh maybe are under the bus. Like, what is it? Because it's almost, it's a prison of sorts. Right. I mean, it's like, it is like circumlocution. It's like reasoning. It's like, it feeds itself a little bit of something, and then everybody shares it very quickly. And then the next thing comes in to the cage, and then it gets shared. And so there becomes this, like, language, like, you know, it's like, there becomes this very claustrophobic language mm -hmm. uh, that is some, most of contemporary art. Uh, that, wow, God, that's such a broad statement, but it's like... It's okay, no one's listening. <laughs> no, I know, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, Jesus. I mean, it, become, it becomes that sort of, like, speaking of mimetic, it becomes, it is, it is like meme-like. It is like, it is, it, it is the snake eating its own tail to some degree, and I feel like it's, it's, more, it's ever possible now with things like social media, with things like Tumblr, with things that, that there is sort of like, like you're saying, it's not, it's, there's no plus, there's, it's just like nothing. So there is no real consequence. Yeah. And so I feel like when you, when you do something like this or when you do something physically, there is, there is more consequence. I, I'm not sure, but I, I'll stop the sentence before that. Do you, okay, so a way of asking is, do you think, let's say painting wasn't there for you in the same way, let's kind of an alternate timeline. In some ways, would you have had to have stepped away from that aspect of all of the things you had built? Because I think it's significant how much you built. And I think, and I'm pressing this point because I think that, um, you know, no one wants to, nobody wants to forget historically that, you know, um, an individual was a sign painter, or an individual did stat photography at a magazine. And this is obviously like relating to pa painters of the past, um, or, or you know, Richard Prince's relationship to being a stat photographer and working with a whole host of people at time, all of whom were artists, including people like Carol Dunham. And that those things um, had profound effects on what they would do when they would not be doing them anymore. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing this out because I, I see a 
that you participated in something that actually doesn't exist anymore. Oh, right. That this thing, this space of activity f for people who were pre-WWW or people who worked in command line coding or people who worked before broadband and did internet based creative experimental stuff or people who first jumped in when broadband allowed people to start sending and sharing time based stuff. Each one of these things is a window in time and the technology and the industry behind it wants to shut that window. They want to shut that window as fast as they can because if they can, then they can successfully replace it with something else and enlarge the audience. So you were doing projects in the fullest capacity that th that platform would allow until that platform replaced the possibility of doing those things yourself. And you could see at that point, let's imagine only looking at things from completely unartistic standpoints, the end of all blogs that existed online for the most part from, let's say, 100% at their high point to what's now about 0.2% to everybody utilizing platforms in order to have any form of public expression. That the entire space is not theirs anymore, that they don't have their URL or author it. Well, that, that's a fundamental change, especially when that platform can set terms for your aspect ratio or your, your, the length of words you use or any of those things. You what did it. Here is first. Yeah. yeah, you did it in a time, and other people were doing it in different ways, not all artists. And then right around the time you stopped doing it, it actually kind of stopped happening. And I would, I guess that's a long way of saying, would you have ever even been interested in continuing having any public persona online after, you know, roughly that time? Which I think that threshold happened, we were talking about, I think that threshold was somewhere between 2008 and 2010 when the numbers really right. shifted and, and things started to get eradicated that were self-authored online and everybody was dependent on proprietary, broad platforms to communicate. Yeah, I mean, it was a mass exodus from, from personal websites and from, uh, like, sort of finding things on your own, I think, in that, in that time. Uh, and then people, you know, grouping themselves, like you're saying, in this public-private space, yeah. uh, which is MySpace, and then, which was then Facebook, and then... Then YouTube, you know, I, got, I was an early adopter of YouTube, but then it just got crowded yeah. with shit. Yeah. I mean, it's just such, like, it's terrible now. I mean, Petra had said, right, she did a talk at YouTube, and she's like, I just want to start off by saying I fucking hate YouTube. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's like, it's, it's like really... No, it, was, it had a really good Wild it West had a moment. Good, it did. It yeah. did. All of it did, you yeah. know? And I think, I think you're, I mean, it's, some, it's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it is like... Like, what would you have done? You know what I mean? Like, in the hypothetical, what would you have done? How would you want to be another brick in that kind of wall when you got to be your own building. I mean, that's right. the trade-off, right? Right. The trade-off is, oh, you right. had a whole city and your city was cool. We would like that city to be burned down. Right. And then we'd like to cake the ashes and make it a brick inside of this much bigger wall of shit that a lot of people are going to look. And that, like, knocked out the 13-year-old in their bedroom, too. Totally. I mean, it's not, this is not just about the individual who has the time and the energy to make something that looks or acts or functions like a big branded thing because they know enough to do it. This is about a kid in a room talking into, you know, uh, uh, a camera that's not built even into their computer yet. So they've gone that far to do that, to be there, and they don't even understand that the space behind them is going to be analyzed for its quantitative value and then turned into a form and then they're going to make that bedroom and make that kid and construct that face and then market it. Mm -hmm. Like that all of those things would be consumed and then put back out there to make a PewDiePie work for 40 million viewers or something like that, right? right? Like that's what you, it's a toxic space. Is this a less toxic space? Painting. All of it making things, like material things or objects, whatever. I mean, it's not without its, bye -bye. it's not without its toxicity at all. I mean, I think like this is like, you come to painting, I didn't even want to hang the paintings on the walls initially. I was going to have them hang on shelves mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't want to be in direct conversation with the, the, the language of painting. Uh, I mean, you know, all But art, you are. But now I am. <laughs> you totally are. Uh, but, you know, I think I... Yeah, I didn't want to like swerve and dodge that. 
And yeah. I, I thought, just go for it and just see how it goes and, and, and take it, take your legs. Are you angry? <laughs> I am, yeah. What do you think, what, in what way? <laughs> I mean, uh, like, what, I don't know. I'm angry about a lot of shit, man. I mean, what do you want to know? <laughs> well, <laughs> so, okay. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, ang just like, anger, anger's like a dialogue, a right? So yeah. it's like you're in dialogue with something. You know, I'm, I'm angry at things, and I know at any given time what host of things I'm upset with. They could be my own, or they could be a force outside of me that is destroying things, or they could be what the art world is and how it operates, any of these things, or any, anything. It could be, you know, con having a kid and watching content that's basically being generated to market product to usurp every possible creative thought a child could have so it would be part of their brand. Like, that makes me angry, right? So you are, your anger changes, it evolves, right? You are angry at your mom. Then you're angry with yourself. Then you're angry with the systems that are supposed to support you. So where are you now? What is it like? Is this the thing you're angry against? Like figuring this thing out? Or is this the thing you're angry at? Dealing with what institutionalization feels like? Or none of those things? Like, where does that go? I mean, I guess, I mean, there was a lot of anger in not finding a place for myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that was also the thing that drove all the work. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like, like I said it and you got very angry at me. <laughs> <laughs> I said it in school. I was like, I'm too dumb to be an artist and I'm not attractive enough to be an actor or some sh stupid shit like that. What, did you get angry at I that? I mean, that was the stupidest shit I mean, isn't shit that ever. something worth so getting sorry, angry at? But I said it and I was like, poor me, I'm the fucking victim. I actually had a fucking t-shirt in college that said victim on it. it I mean, I was That like, would not go over I well mean, on campuses I, today. No, I would wear it around with my no. little, little scowling no. face. No, like you're definitely not upset. a victim. Like, where's my piece of the pie? You know, I mean, I think, I think like I was just always angry that I couldn't find a place to like Is sit Is that and rest. anger past now or does it transform into this? Like what, is that angry or is that funny? As example, like no, as a form. No, it's like remorse. I think like this show, like obfuscating a lot of the faces and, and putting these fucking clown noses on everybody. It's just like, it's a gestural way of, of yeah, of getting, of like throwing a temper tantrum to some degree, you know? And so it's like... I, at the value of things? or At, at the, the value of things, at the value of trying, at the value of coming to a place of, of understanding and then realizing that I don't want to be there, in fact. I'd rather be in the uncomfortable place. I'd rather be, uh, I'd rather just, just, I don't know, exist in, in chaos, exist in like... What's that mean? It just exists in like a place that is uneasy. I, I, if, if something gets easy, I want to like fuck it up and make it uneasy. Mm -hmm. And so I think like, I, I, I don't know how to deal with comfortable. And so I Do think- Do you think that this is uncomfortable? For me, it's very fucking uncomfortable. <laughs> how is it? <laughs> not this event, no, this, I mean, the show. This is like, that That's, times yeah, 10, yeah. you know? It's like talking but to is, the, is this body of work, people. does this body of work inhabit discomfort? Yes. How? I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's attempting at coming to an honest place with myself, which is also why I got away from digital culture, because I feel like there's no space for that anymore. So I feel like it's an attempt to get to an honest place with myself and with my personality, who I am, and putting it, and finally just saying, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna put it out there. I'm not gonna like, uh, I, haven't ha I haven't had many shows in my life. I, I really just, I haven't felt the need to have something exist as a solid object on a wall mm -hmm. or on in the middle of a floor. From what was, did something, is something lost? And I think it's a natural thing. It's not, um, it's not a trick question. But is something lost to go from that other space where things were far more um, immaterial, even if they were recorded or documented, even if they require something. But all, even your video works, the earliest video works that you did afterwards, the stuff you did with Chris, or the, your most recent video work with movement? Yeah, moving, yeah. Moving. 
thank you. Um, there's a, there's, it's not just a comedy in that, but there's a kind of absurdism, right? Does this, Im th so is there something lost in what happens when things become permanent in the way that a painting becomes permanent or an object on a pedestal becomes permanent? Like, is there something lost in that? Or is that, or, or the opposite, is nothing lost because it isn't fleeting, it isn't lost, it isn't, I'll watch it or I won't watch it, I'll watch it all the way through or I won't watch it, I get it, I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, in that sense, like, painting is an all at once like I was saying, like, as film is, so, like, I think the painting's very much tied to the language of cinema for me, and the fact that, you know, I was saying that, that you, you know, when you're watching a movie, you're watching a frame, and it leaves, and another one comes in. Right. Yeah. So you're, you're in the present, past, and future at the same time in, in watching cinema. You don't ever think about that. Um, but this is the same way, except it's the whole film, I feel like, at once, all the time. And so I feel like, yes, nothing is lost, but there is a translation of energy problem. And I felt like uh. that's, why, that's why I did not have a show of photography, which was maybe my inclination. Mm -hmm. I feel like that entombed something so far. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is like, once you take a photo, and, sorry, I know you're a photographer, <laughs> but once you, take, once you take an image and put it on the wall that is highly representational in that way, it's hard, it, would, it was hard for me to reconcile with that as being lively or having the energy that I have. Right. And so moving image did that. Photography didn't do that. Right. And moving image and performance wasn't working for me, so this was the transition. And now I'm facing that problem of how to properly translate energy. Do you think this, do you think this or something here is a close approximation to retaining that energy? Like, is there a thing in your new body of work, which is really symbolic of a transition in you, which is the point of this whole conversation. Because this isn't number two, this is number one. Right. This is not part of some canon of doing works like this. This is the beginning of doing works like this after a very long figuring that our one year is their five years and their five years was someone else's ten years. It's, you know, it is the manner in which things are happening and things happen has contracted. So this is a, you know, the amount of time you spent online or in that world making work was a long time once we graphed it on top of how long those things have been here in our world, right? Not that long, and you've been there since some of their origins, right? Some of the origins of things. So you've left that, you're doing this, this is the first time. Is something in here maintaining some of that energy? Because that energy is quite real. Yeah. It is your voice or your face too, and those aren't there. That haven't been there for a while, but there's some, so is Mark in this, or is, is a lot of you in one of these things? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of me in, in well, the, the title, Interior Day, A Door Opens. I mean, it's in the language of Sima. It also implies, you know, that a door is opening. It's a new chapter, it's a new beginning. And then it implies that a door closes, you know, which is that of which I was a public performer, a performer, or a social interjectionist. I don't know what you would call me. But I think, like, what's most honest is the drawings, because they're on a very intimate scale. Right. And it's a very intimate, like, it's, it's those. those drawings. Yeah, yeah, way back there. there. Over there. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny. I mean, usually I hide the most honest thing mm -hmm. and want, and then perform some other sort of, like, uh, role as gesture or something. So I feel like some of it is performing the role of a gesture, but I think those, those are honest, and that painting over there, the purple one with the little village at the bottom is also, that was the last work that I made before I hung the show, and I think that was sort of the departure, and that's the area in which, you know, I, I want to go. Right, and that is the most Twomley ask, and we talked about Cy Twomley. Right, exactly. And your, your interest in his practice. In his, in his line making, you know, yeah. his mark making, it's honest and it's, it's deliberate, it's intentional, he, he does it until it feels natural. And I felt like that was the most natural, liberating piece that I made in here. You know, I mean, the guy stabbing himself uh, with the eight ball cane, it says BRB on it, is also, it's very, this and this are very self, they're self and this are like very self-portraiture, you know. Right. It's like stabbing yourself over and over again in public and smiling about it 
you know, yeah. as you're just fucking failing. You is know? this the end of, did this do it? And like, did it, did it, does this bring that to a close? Because that's not yes. that, right? That's not that at all. That painting is a completely different thing. And it's not, it doesn't actually have in any way that would be understood by its viewer, it doesn't have an autobiographical component. It could be autobiographical in its broadest sense, and it can be about your thinking, but it's not you. It's not the body, it's not the subject, so knowing you, and people could know you. I mean, that's not something that's disconnected. There's no mystery when we go into a show, or there's much less mystery than there might have been in the past about who the person is, or things about the person who's making whatever we're looking at. So those things are very clear, but is this you getting past that? Yes. Very okay, much so. we're almost done, so I have one last question. Oh, fuck. Are you, I mean it. Are you, are you happy? In general? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think this is the happiest I've ever been in my life, you know? Is that threatening? Terribly. Why? <laughs> well, I mean, I've never owned a couch before. I've never had uh, blankets and extra pillows and uh, two televisions. Right. I mean, seriously, I fucking swear to God. No, I mean, but it's I like, know, yeah, it's I terrifying know, I get that. Me, so what you know? is scary? So you haven't had those things so you can wake up and say, is that me? Or look in the mirror and be like, oh, I'm married. Oh, my God. You know, what all those. And I think the majority of us that weren't born with wealth can feel that in life when we haven't OD'd or we haven't fucked up to the point that we're, you know, on a federal list or any of the things that are really possible, really possible <laughs> okay. and easy to get on. So, <laughs> but the problem is it's kind of fun to run that line and be that and be on that razor's edge because you can be very generative. Is it scary to be on firmer ground? And, and still have to come up with ideas and make things. Not really, though. I mean, I, I, those, those, those accoutrements, you know, uh, are, they're there, but I, st I mean, my work ethic is insane, and I, I constantly am making problems for myself at every corner. Okay. And so yeah. I think, like, if it's not a financial problem, or it's not uh, a, a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the base level, you know, food, shelter, love, if it's not right. that, then it's right. got to be going up. It's going to be terrifying. It's still the same feeling. So you feeling. keep yourself unstable. It's like crawling across glass all day long. Good. <laughs> yeah. Good. So that, that keeps you generative. Yes. If something's working, I immediately say, that's wrong. And I'll go the other way. Okay. And it's very fucking, it's, it's hard on a lot of people. <laughs> I know it is, sure. you know, but they don't care. And it's hard, you know, it's hard in terms of like making an actual artistic product. Right. That like, oh, but you should have a voice and you should have a style and 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 uh, if we're going to really be in this uh, of this yeah, I don't know. Well, I'm not going to go No, go that. there because we're about to end. So okay. just go there. It's not safe, but go. But I mean, if you want to if, if if you really, you know, want to represent what's going on currently in your work, then it's going to be as, it's going to be ever shifting and it's going to be wrong. It's going to be broken. It's not going to resemble the last thing. It's going to be different. It's going to be problematic. It's going to suck. It's going to be great. Every painting is not going to be the same painting. It's going to be extremely different, extremely problematic, you know, mm -hmm. and this show is a little too clean for me. So I think the next one is going to be very different, very difficult, and, uh, do you think that any part of you would ever dip even a toe, or maybe you already do, because we kind of all live there anyways, would you ever dip a toe back into public persona in any form? Yeah, but it would be like, yeah, I was going to say a terrible word. I'm not going to say it. It would, okay. <laughs> like what we were talking about, the antithesis to Facebook. But I think that uh, it, would be a, it, would be, it would be different. I mean, right. it would be, that was levity, that was fun, that was great. It would be dark. It would be very, very, very dark, that right. entrance. <laughs> right. Federal list, though. I know there are. I know. Okay. I think we did it at an hour. Beautiful. Thanks, dude. That was good. That was good. Okay. Thanks, man.